Lewis encouraged Marion to start writing stories based on her early life. With him by her side, she could now unleash her creative powers. Depend upon it. You would gain unspeakably if you would learn with me to see some of the poetry and the pathos, the tragedy and the comedy, lying in the experience of a human soul that looks out through dull, grey eyes and that speaks in a voice of quite ordinary tones. One day, George went into town on purpose to leave me a quiet evening for writing. And I read to George when he came home, and we both cried over it. And then he came to me, and he kissed me, and he said, I think your pathos is better than your fun. Virgil Homer, John Milton. At last, Marion had started writing fiction in Edward. earnest, but she was worried that her reputation might sour her literary success. Dickens or Spaniel? George. She decided to publish under a pen name. I like your name. Mm. The author George Eliot was born. Lewis sent off Marion's manuscript to his publisher, saying that George Eliot was a shy Warwickshire clergyman who wanted to remain anonymous. George had always protected me from criticism. Always. He knew that it pained me, sometimes into a morbid fear of ever writing again. The name George Eliot became my mask, behind which I could hide my errors, and my vanities. But little did he or Marion know what trouble this would eventually cause them. In 1858, at the age of 38, Marion's first novel was published. Scenes of Clerical Life was a huge success. George Eliot's work was a revelation to her Victorian readers. Her characters were not heroic. Her stories were not melodramatic. She wrote, often in rural dialects, about ordinary lives and real human dilemmas. She based her first novel, Scenes of Clerical Life, on her childhood memories of growing up in a small Warwickshire community. In her fictional village, Shepperton, the local gossip revolves around the scandalous antics of the minister, Amos Barton. Barton gets entangled with a mysterious countess who moves into the parish. Talking of scandal, returned Mr. Fellows, have you heard the last story about Barton? Nisbet was telling me the other day that he dines alone with the countess at six while Mrs. Barton is in the kitchen acting as cook. I wish dining alone together may be the worst of that sad business, said the Reverend Archibald Duke. Gentlemen, may I introduce the great chronicler of our glorious countryside? The novelist George Eliot. Good day. Everybody knew that George Eliot was a pen name, but nobody had met the actual writer. Enter a certain Joseph Liggins, claiming that he was the real George Eliot. It's a disgrace that poor Liggins should be Why anybody believed that this down and out from Nuneaton was a literary genius is anybody's guess, but his claim quickly gained support. Perhaps it was all just a ruse to gain money. That poor man is a victim of those great and greedy publishing houses. Isn't that so, Mr. Leggins? Yeah. Leggins was quick to claim credit for Marion's second novel. The hero, Adam Bede, falls in love with Hetty Sorrel, who later has a child out of wedlock and is sentenced to hang for the murder of her baby. But at the words, and then to be hanged by the neck, 
till you be dead, a piercing shriek rang through the hall. It was Hetty's shriek. Adam started to... Adam Bede was an immediate bestseller. The Times published a letter stating that Liggins was indeed its author. It was deeply shocking. Might I ask if the act of publishing a book deprive a person of all claim to the usual courtesies? If not, the attempt to publish rumours seems to me quite indefensible. Still more so to state those rumours as ascertained truths. Gentlemen, please. It's more than I can... Liggins wasn't giving up. He'd now even started calling himself George Eliot, and a manuscript of Adam Bede, in his handwriting, was being circulated. This was his downfall. Marion's publishers could prove that Liggins' handwriting was different from earlier letters they'd received from George Eliot. He was finally exposed as a fraud. But if Liggins wasn't George Eliot, who was? Some people had already begun to suspect the truth. Surely it is the Evans woman. The books are not so uniformly dreary as that <laughs> poor creature. <laughs> Quite. That dry stick hasn't the talent to write a note to her seamstress. <laughs> <laughs> Another article was published, this time in the influential Athenaeum magazine, hinting that Marion Evans might be George Eliot. It is time to end this pother about the authorship of Adam Bede. The author is a clever woman with an observant eye and an unschooled moral nature. Her work has no great quality of any kind. No great quality. Unschooled moral nature. Marion was furious at the implication that her relationship with Lewis was immoral. Finally, she went public. I knew it. No, no, I knew it. What do you mean? I knew it all the time. That Marion Evans had to be George Eliot. And I told you all. By the time The Mill on the Floss was published in 1860, Marion's life was transformed by wealth and success. It was extraordinary how her critics were able to forget her morals now that she was famous. Once isolated by even her closest friends, she was now receiving a constant stream of visitors, fan letters and gifts. Oh, oh wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? Marion and Lewis found a deepening love for one another. They charmed, supported, and entertained each other. What satisfaction canst thou have tonight? Hmm. The exchange of thy love's faithful vow for mine? I gave thee mine before thou didst request it. My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love as deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. Then give me all. George, I think you've departed from the text. If there was one action or relation in my life that had always been profoundly serious, it was my relation with Mr. Lewis. Our life together was more and more blessed, more and more complete. Success was sweet. But Marion didn't easily forget what it felt like to be the target of gossip and condemnation. Silas Marner, the hero of her next book, is lonely and misunderstood. And his life is miraculously transformed when he finds an abandoned child at his door. You'll take the child to the parish in the morning. Who says so? They can't make me. Why, you don't want to keep her, do you, an old bachelor like you? I do. Till anyone shows they've a right to her. It's a lone thing, and I'm a lone thing. It's, it's come to me. In a sense, George Eliot found a child on her own doorstep. 
Marion and Lewis never wanted a child of their own that would suffer the stigma of illegitimacy. But in 1861, Lewis' son Charles wrote to Marion. I remain, dear mother, affectionately yours, Charles Lewis. <laughs> 